All right, I'm here today to talk about uh, one of the things about uh, the, the work that Dick is doing with UEFI uh, reporting uh, group. One of the things you should do is you should build your own test strategy. So you're, it's likely that your supplier, like your bias vendor, like inside, has already worked on this. But you should at least think about what you should be doing as an OEM or an ODM also, or a hardware supplier. These are the topics I'm going to be discussing. So the first one is why do security testing, some areas to test, and then the available test, where you can get uh, test. And then we'll, I'll discuss some next steps. So. One of the questions I had to address internally at Insight is why have the security researchers decided to start test uh, attacking UEFI? And in, in my idea is the best thing that I could come up with is because UEFI is everywhere now. It's on all your tablets, a lot of your tablets, all of your PCs, all of your notebook computers, all of your desktop computers. A lot of the servers now have UEFI, and a lot of the industrial controllers out there. So it's it's really just about everywhere now. And in the last few years since Windows 8 came out, we've gone from hiding the BIOS in the CSM to actually exposing UEFI on everything. So the UEFI interfaces are available everywhere. Obviously, adding something like Secure Boot in the Windows 8 timeframe added a, an attraction for the security researchers. Now they have something that claims to be secure. It gives them a target to go attack. And the security researchers, the reason they're so interested in this now is that uh, the UEFI provides a lot of uh, defined interfaces into the BIOS. So the OS has ways of going into the BIOS and getting information. All of the OS is now required, right? Windows 8 supports it, and a lot of the different versions of Linux now support UEFI. And most importantly, they have a, an example source base. Right? They can go to Tiana Core, they can download the source code, and they can go through there and, and look for issues. And one of the recent issues that was published is specifically against the, the Tiana Core code. So for you as an OEM or an ODM or a hardware supplier, why should you do security testing? So if we look at these machines that we're building nowadays compared to the PCs that were that we built 20 or 30 years ago, these machines are a lot more complex. There's a lot of configuration to do for these machines than there were was in the past. And if you look at it now, just the simplest modification, one bit in one processor register, or one bit in one Southbridge register, can make a big difference. For example, if you change the BIOS control, just one bit in the BIOS control register that's in the PCH in an Intel chipset, the BIOS becomes writable. If this BIOS <coughs> is writable, then the, the security researcher or the hacker can attack the BIOS, can insert some code in the BIOS, and if they're skilled, that code can do just about anything that the, that the machine wants it to. Right? It, can, it can inspect IP packets coming across in the browser. It could do anything. It could watch keystrokes. It could watch the mouse moving around on the screen. This one example right, could turn any machine into a brick. So this would be an obvious warranty issue for an OEM. Also could be a major issue for any customer that had their machine turned into a so this is why we need to be doing security testing. We've decided we want to start doing security testing. What do we need to test? 
So the first thing to look at is any interface into the BIOS, any way to get data to the BIOS. So the obvious first, thought, first place to look at are the interfaces from the OS. So we, there are a few interfaces that are opened up. There's the get UEFI variable, there's the write UEFI variables. Those interfaces need to be tested to make sure they're secure. Any of the network interfaces, if you provide any sort of networking in your BIOS, you need to provide a, you need to start testing. <coughs> any of the interfaces into the SMM or security coprocessors need to be tested. Any external port interface is a good place to test, right? Keyboard interfaces, uh, sometimes it's possible to attack the system from the keyboard. Uh, mice, USB ports, uh, PCI slots are, are very good. Uh, I noticed this morning uh, a company that is working on a, a PCI card that plugs into the PCI card slot and looks at ways to do DMA attacks. So this is a commercially available card that you can just plug in and, and, and do DMA attacks and expect memory. Uh, another good one, ROM storage, right? Any, anything that controls the storage, the protection of the storage on the, on the ROM device. SMI, anything that controls the protection in SMI space. There's some really good registers out there now that, that keep you from being able to just writing into SMI. We want to test those and make sure that we have those set correctly. Device update is the one that, that uh, is another attack that was just recently uh, uh, published. One of the ones that uh, is in the was in the Tiano Core source code, and uh, so this is an area that you want to test. And then for OEMs and ODMs, it's it's really important to to pull a machine off the factory line before it's going to be shipped. Pull a first first ship sample out. Make sure that you have all the settings correct. It was a, a case of someone running a test program for uh, CompuTrace and leaving the test uh, tool in place so that you could attack the CompuTrace tool, uh, module. These kind of things are, are dangerous to leave in the shipping machines. So you've decided that you want to test. You've decided what areas you want to test. What are some good, good places to go get test tools? So silicon vendors, uh, both of the major x86 silicon vendors have test tools available for your for testing. Uh, some of them are open source tools. Some of them are, are covered by your NDA. Some of the security researchers are now publishing test tools. MITRE is the one that uh, that uh, has been publicizing the BIOS right issues over the years, the last couple of years. They have a tool now called Copernicus. You can download this on the internet. I'll, I have examples of it. Uh, most of your bias vendors, I know that we have a, a fairly rich uh, suite of test tools that we can provide to our customers. I have some examples of those later. And of course, you can also go look on the hacker websites you need to be careful there. Uh, I've got some examples of some of those tools also. So for example, Intel. Intel has a really good tool called Chipset. And this is the website for it. The engine for Chipset is available. You can download it, you can inspect it, you can make sure you understand what it does. The open source version has some test scripts that do some really good testing. And then of course there's a uh, there are probably some NDA versions available that they release on a regular basis. Um, that's one of the things that we run a, regularly run against our platforms that before we ship the source code off to the OE, ODMs and OEMs. Intel also has my favorite tool, which is Self-Test. Uh, it's an NDA tool that's only available uh, to their uh, customers and the people that they directly support. Intel Bits is available as an open source tool. It's mainly a uh, processor test. Make sure that the, all of the processor registers are set correctly. It's not specifically for security, 
but you can use it to inspect the, the processor. The good thing about most Intel tools is that they do identify errors. So if you've got a register set incorrectly, uh, it will pop up and, and tell you that you have a failure. For example, Chipsync, the, the, uh, the one that has open source and NDA versions, I hacked up a BIOS and uh, turned on the, the ability to write into the BIOS region and uh, it very quickly down here at the bottom comes up and it says fail, right? I left some of the SMI configuration registers set up correctly, incorrectly and it identifies that for me. This, uh, this tool generates uh, pages and pages of output so you do need to be able to go through there and, and look for the failures. But it's really good down at the bottom it does tell you how many failures you, you had in, your, in the file to begin with. This is one of the tools that's on the, the USB key that Brian gave away yesterday. Intel self-test. My favorite tool uh, as a BIOS engineer I used to anytime someone would call me and complain that, that there was a problem in their BIOS I would ask the, the FAE or the uh, project manager and say, well, send me the, the output of self-test. About half the time they would, they, would, they would send me the output and I would look at it and I could help easily identify what registers were set wrong. The other half of the time, just, just going out and running self-test, they could find the error themselves. So it's really good. Usually if, there's a, if, if you've got the register set correctly, it gives you a check mark. If you've got it set wrong, it'll, it'll, it'll give you a flag and, and it's red and it'll say something's wrong. Unfortunately, occasionally, you'll see that it comes back and it says don't care. We've got the bit set uh, the wrong way, but uh, self the engineer that set up self-test didn't care about that bit. Uh, you have to be careful over, the t over time. The, some of the information in self-test does get stale, gets out of date, and uh, the recommendations change, and Intel does not go back and update self-test, right? So this is a, a three or four year old chipset that I'm running here, and so the information from Intel is they, don't, they used to not care about this bit, and now they do. So if I ran this against, uh, let's say, uh, Broadwell, this would probably show up as a failure. But for an older chipset, it does not. So getting back, getting to the outside, outside the silicon vendors, MITRE, for example, is one of the security researchers. They're really interested in, in permanence, getting their, their hack into the BIOS, mainly because if you can get permanence, then you don't ever have to worry about somebody finding your, your hack and taking it out of the code. So these guys got started looking at, um, um, looking at ways to get between, get into a machine before the OS got started. So they, they were real interested when they found out that there were things like root kits available. So, they went out and they started researching root kits. And as they were researching root kits, they came across this thing called the BIOS. And they went, wow, you mean there's code that runs before the OS? And they were really surprised by this. And so they, they started looking into the OS and they realized that, wow, this is really pretty cool. You know, I can do things here that you just can't do in an operating system. So. The next thing they did was, well, how can I get into the uh, into the BIOS? And they started looking at the asset access control bits. And they so they created a tool, Copernicus. And what it does is it runs on a machine, it does some data collection, and then you go back to your desk and you run some Python scripts to analyze the BIOS output. And then you resume review the results. One of the problems with Copernicus, in my view, is uh, that it does not identify something as being a failure. I've got some examples. So the other problem with Copernicus is they don't analyze every chipset. So if you were to run this tool against the Broadwell platform, for example, 
it would come back as, as an unknown device. This actually happens to be an older generation uh, uh, netbook. Uh, this was a, a Clover Trail, I believe, and uh, they didn't understand this platform. The other problem is th these guys are pretty technical, so they're not going to give you a dummy flag and say, hey, there's a failure. What they're going to say is the BIOS is unlocked, one. Right? So you know, they're going to expect you to have enough knowledge of what's going on to be able to say, oh, okay, I have an unlocked BIOS platform. Or in, in some cases, you know, I'm, I'm vulnerable to this particular vulnerability that the U.S. CERT organization has published. So, you know, this is not the most uh, uh, factory floor friendly or, or QA test lab friendly tool, but it can be used. So, uh, those are some of the things that are available to just about anyone. Um, for Insight, we, we've spent the last five or six years working on, on various vulnerabilities that we found in the, in the open source code, and we've, we've been writing tools to test against these things to make sure that, that we've either fixed them or we're not, um, we're not affected by these, these issues. One of them is, is a tool that we've written recently that, that tests the SMI input parameters. It's mainly focused on the buffers to make sure that uh, if someone were to pass in a buffer that's pointing out into application memory that you can't access the application memory or you can't put something that would be dangerous to that application out into the memory. So we call it, we're really inventive, we call this the private interface tester. Uh, we have versions that run in on 64-bit platforms and in 32-bit uh, platforms. We have a much larger toolbox that we've created. It has about 20 separate tests. It's mainly interested in, uh, uh, its main focus is uh, testing UEFI variables. Although it does have some CMOS testing and some long-run testing and uh, it does enable uh, variable reclaim testing. So these are the kind of things that our QA test lab runs on all of our platforms. This is an example output from the private interface tester. You can see uh, there's that the BIOS on this platform actually had a failure. The error here is that the input buffer memory can uh, overlap with SMM. So, for example, in this case, I could I could write some I could craft some special code, and it could uh, get inserted into the SMM space from a user level application. So, this would be a really dangerous thing to allow in a production machine uh, that was running Windows, for example, because it could allow a, any application that was run on Windows to uh, get inserted into SMM space. Again, this is just a hacked up example that I, uh, that I did in the last few weeks as I was writing this uh, presentation. The Inside Toolbox, which is a standard tool that we've had available for a number of years now, does a lot of uh, testing, the, a lot of the variable reclaim. It can do things like causing variable reclaim space so it'll go out and it'll write in a lot of uh, variables, it will delete some, it can cause all sorts of illegal uh, configuration in the variable space, it understands the, the structure of the variable space so it can go in and, and wipe out uh, variables, it can wipe out parts of variables, it can do all sorts of, uh, it can go out and grab the variables and put them in a file. So this is a, a, a tool that the uh, is used by a lot of kernel engineers to make sure that, that the variable space, any changes that they've made to the code around variables has been well tested. I did go out and look at a lot of uh, hacker tools. I do want to caution you if, you do, if you're doing this on an unprotected PC. I've noticed that uh, a number of the hacker tools show up as, as having viruses. Um, I did, the ones that I have here, um, 
I did go to, to the source of the hacker tool and, and uh, uh, feel fairly comfortable that these are uh, not infected. Please use them at your own risk though because it's possible that someone has inserted something in the hacker tool. Right? But these, looks, these seem to be fairly good and useful uh, tools. The, obviously some of these tools are based on code that's in the Tiano core. There's some good tools in Tiano core for inspecting variables, for example. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but uh, for example, uh, the, the search for signatures inside binary files, this tool actually understands uh, uh, PK7 ver uh, certificates and can look for a PK7 certificate in a file. So it can see this, once it finds it, it just identifies it as being there and uh, it would be up to whoever is, is, is working, looking for these signatures to figure out why it's in there. Okay, so the next steps. As, a, as an engineer working at an ODM or an engineer working at an OEM, you need to decide for your projects how much testing you need to do. You need to think about each of the multiple phases of your project. Don't just test at the end. Go ahead and look at your design documents. Decide early on how you want to test. What do you want to test? If you write private interfaces, do your private interfaces have security holes in them? If it does, you need to go fix the security hole early so that you don't ship with a security hole. During your development phase, you need to check and see what is open. Is anything unlocked? If something's unlocked, do you have a plan for making sure that it gets locked in the factory? In the manufacturing phase, you need to make sure that when you're ready to ship a system, that it's really shipped. Don't ship it with back doors. Don't ship it with test code. Don't leave your secure boot disabled if you want to ship a machine that's got secure boot turned on. So these are the types of things you need to be looking at. The thing here is that, remember, we are going to uh, there are going to be future hacks. There are people, there are researchers out looking at ways to attack your, your bias. Go ahead and let's all, we need to get ready to do field updates. Over the next few years, the UEFI forum is going to be actively looking at this. So let's get ready and do it as much as we can without the forum. And more places to go get some information. All right, thanks.